Good morning. Our next presenting company is Argos Therapeutics. Argos Therapeutics is a company that we assisted in taking public a couple of years ago. And they are progressing their pipeline a very interesting time for the next, uh, I'll call it six to 18 months, with a phase three trial with their lead candidate from their Acellus uh, platform in metastatic renal cell cancer. So it's a pleasure to introduce Mr. Jeff Abbey, the company's CEO. Jeff's gonna tell us a little bit about his platform and his uh, pipeline, and then we'll take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for having me. So we are a public company. So as Charles said, our technology platform, uh, which we call Arcellus, um, it is uh, led to our phase three program, AGS-003, our lead program in metastatic RCC. Arcellus is a fully individualized immunotherapy. Uh, we take uh, RNA from the patient's tumor, so we're capturing all of the neoantigens, all the mutations, uh, including the driver mutations, from the patient's own disease, and then programming a fully optimized dendritic cell uh, to make a product that speaks only to a specific subpopulation of T cells called memory T cells. And this leads to T cell attack on the patient's uh, tumor and only on the tumor. So we have no collateral damage. And in our phase two trial, in metastatic kidney cancer, we saw a direct correlation between the increase in the level of these memory T cells after five doses and all of the relevant clinical benefit the patient would see. So overall survival, progression-free survival, and tumor regression. Uh, as Charles said, we're in phase three in metastatic RCC, which is where we've been focused. Uh, we have completed enrollment of our phase three trial. Uh, we have our next IDMC data review in June. Uh, we expect one after that in December and final data in the first half of next year. Uh, in our phase two trial, uncontrolled data, but based on a very well-characterized patient population, uh, patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease live for around 16 months on standard of care. Our patients lived uh, for over 30 months median. Uh, we have uh, addressed the manufacturing issues involved with the autologous cell therapy so that we're able with our current manual process uh, to be able to achieve biopharma-like margins because we make multiple doses from one batch, treating a patient for three years on average. And uh, we will then migrate to a fully automated manufacturing process as we scale up when we're commercial. Uh, and because it is a platform, everything we do in advanced kidney cancer, we can do in any solid tumor and actually move into hematologic malignancies with only a little bit of development work. So just very briefly, uh, as I said, we take the RNA from the patient's tumor, so that captures all of the mutations, including the driver mutations, the neoantigens. Uh, we then use that to program a fully optimized dendritic cell, and one of the things we do is we load an RNA encoding CD40 ligand which provides a signal that we have shown is missing in cancer patients. So that signal normally comes from CD4 helper cells. So we provide that in the form of RNA with the patient's RNA. So you get this fully optimized dendritic cell expressing all of those neoantigens on its surface. And as I said, uh, the result is you convert naive CD8 cells into these memory T cells, and then those lead to the killer T cells, which are targeting the tumor and only the tumor. And you can see IL-12 there, that is our potency marker, and we've sh published and shown that IL-12 production is the key from your dendritic cell in order to get this T cell response. Uh, as I mentioned, we make about three years of doses from one collection. Uh, our only lead time issue is getting the cells from the clinical site to Argos, but we have four days to do that. The tumor is stable at room temperature for a week, and the final product is frozen and shipped frozen. And all they have to do at the clinical site is take it out of the shipper 30 minutes ahead of time, let it thaw, put it up in a syringe, and inject into dermal, done. Uh, this allows us to dose the patient five times three weeks apart in the induction phase. As I said, that gets to where we think the T cell response will lead to clinical benefit. And then we boost starting at week 24 every 12 weeks uh, for as long as the patient uh, is uh, responding. 
So we have moved into uh, phase three, as I mentioned, uh, data expected, interim data this year in June and likely again in December, final data in the first half of 2013. Uh, we're just about to announce the opening of a neoadjuvant, uh, sorry, the non-small cell uh, trial is about to open, uh, is open actually, a uh, press release going out I think tomorrow. Uh, that is uh, with standard of care, uh, both uh, concurrently and sequentially. Uh, we are doing a neoadjuvant study in metastatic RCC patients, primarily looking at T-cell infiltration. We'll have initial data on that later this year. Hope to present that at SITSI. Uh, and then uh, probably the most important study uh, planned for this year is the combination with a checkpoint inhibitor. And we have some preclinical data showing synergy between our approach and, uh, and checkpoint inhibitor, uh, which we hope to present from a preclinical model that we have. And then bladder cancer also will be starting this year. So with that, I'll talk with Charles. Super. I've got a couple of questions, or several questions. But does the audience have any questions? If not now, please raise your hand. I'll try to grab them. Jeff, so, um, you know, I make one really interesting observation as I look at your stock chart. No one else is right now, but it's really different. Um, it's been a tough year so far in biotech land. I've got four stocks here to date are up a little bit. They're green. Uh, yours is up 100%. Why do you think that is? How's the trial going? Yeah, so I think it's mainly a reflection of what happened at the end of last year where we got, uh, I would say, crushed by the fact that it was clear to people that uh, we had a huge financing overhang that we needed to address. And when we had our IDMC meeting in December, which was a positive one, that the trial was, was fine and going well and no changes and, and should continue, I think rather than that having a positive effect on the stock, it, it made people realize, oh, now they really need to raise money. So I think the fact that we did raise money recently and are now funded uh, into uh, second quarter next year when we present uh, what we expect final data, I think, has removed that financing overhang, and hopefully that's why the stock is now back closer to where it should be. I would argue it's still undervalued. I would argue that too, but <laughs> clearly some people, some institutional investors believe that uh, perhaps patients are living longer than, than what they maybe should do, yeah. what you would expect out of metastatic renal cells. So let's talk about that patient cohort that you're actually studying. Yeah. Um, because we've seen other vaccine trials or even f oncology, you know, small molecules, you know, studied in phase two where they get a provocative result that is not replicated in phase three. So what is it about your trial, your patient cohort that gives you confidence you should continue to invest in this program? Right. So uh, unlike other tumor types, uh, metastatic kidney cancer patients are well characterized based on a risk factor model that predicts survival with a p-value of less than 0 .0001. And this was a model originally developed at Sloan Kettering, has been updated for the tyrosine kinase era, which is standard of care treatment for kidney cancer. And so patients are in three groups, favorable risk, intermediate risk, and poor risk. All the patients we treat, because when they're diagnosed with kidney cancer for the first time, uh, they have metastatic disease, that's the first risk factor. So they're all intermediate and poor. And uh, a combined intermediate and poor patient population gives you a survival uh, of somewhere around 15, 16 months. And this has been published numerous times and substantiated with a data set most recently of 1,200 patients. So um, I don't think that, unlike others, uh, maybe most recently Celdex, we're not going to be, I don't think, surprised by our control arm assumption and what these patients will do on standard of care. And in our phase two trial, with 50-50 intermediate and poor risk, we had 30 months of median overall survival. So basically a doubling of expected. And in phase three, we adjusted the enrollment criteria to enroll uh, over 75% intermediate risk patients who had a median survival in our phase two trial of over 60 months compared to 20 months expected uh, with standard of care. So I think we've enrolled the exact right patient population that is most likely to benefit, knowing that the survival expectation is what 
we would expect. And you feel that the enrollment of the patients wa uh, was true to the protocol? Right, we feel really good about the enrollment because again, these risk factors, there's six of them, and we enrolled patients with one to four. So patients who have zero risk factors are favorable risk. Those are patients who were diagnosed previously and become metastatic in a subsequent year. Those patients are not our initial target patients. But the rest, once they have that one risk factor, the other risk factors are um, uh, blood tests. And we, we stop with four risk factors. So patients with five or six risk factors only live for a few months. So we are uh, obviously stratified by number of risk factors. And uh, as I said, these are well-characterized patients, so there's really no way to mess up your enrollment criteria. So that said, there's been lots of excitement about immuno-oncology, obviously. You know, firm, firm grasp on the obvious here uh, on my part in the last few years. but really hasn't been this kind of platform. What happens to these patients in your trial once they progress? Right. So uh, the standard of care, as I said, is, uh, is TKI and kidney cancer. Uh, we require patients to start on sunitinib, which is the preferred frontline standard of care. After that first cycle, we allow them to switch to any other standard of care uh, therapy other than actually Nexavar, which luckily is not used until fourth or fifth line now because we found that Nexavar actually blocks that T cell response that I uh, mentioned. But every other approved therapy for kidney cancer we've tested and, and has no impact on the T cell response. So generally they'll start with sunitinib. If it's too toxic for them to handle, they'll switch to another TKI like Votriant. Uh, and then after that, they'll progress as they all do pretty much. and and then they'll switch either to a different TKI, or now people are starting to use Opdivo, which is approved for a second and third line. Um, we don't uh, control, as I said, they're allowed to switch to anything. Uh, we're only seeing, because of when Opdivo was recently approved, so far only about 10% of patients uh, have gone on to Opdivo. Uh, we, don't, we see that happening in both arms of the study, uh, so we don't see any imbalance, uh, and we're seeing typically TKI, subsequent TKI, and then either an mTOR, like Toracel, or now Opdivo. Uh, and as I said, that's consistent in both arms of this study. That said, how are you going to manage that with the agency? I believe you recently updated the protocol to do a prospective analysis on that? To do a prospective analysis on, on subsequent standard of care treatment, exactly. So we'll look and be able to answer the question that it's not because of Opdivo that patients are living longer in the experimental arm. That seems prudent. Uh, could be an interesting, call it six to 12 months for you folks. Very interesting, and also has the advantage of giving us uh, data with Opdivo in patients uh, and see what the T cell responses look like, see what survival looks like, and can help us as we think about combining in lung cancer, in bladder cancer, in kidney cancer with uh, anti-PD-1. As I said, the preclinical data we've uh, developed uh, looks very intriguing on the combination of our therapy with the PD-1, so uh, it'll give us real data to look at. That's a big help. Uh, yes, sir. The yeah, the last patient was enrolled in July of last year. Uh, enrollment curve is pretty much what you would expect. It was kind of slow and then up and then steady. Uh, what we expect is uh, that we're somewhere between, now we're approaching about 50%. It's 290 events needed for the statistical analysis uh, based on a hazard ratio of 0.708, uh, assuming 16-month uh, control and just over 22 months uh, for our arm. So we expect we're getting close to 50% of events. So when the IDMC happens in early June, we would expect it to be somewhere around 50% of events. We expect 75% of events towards the end of the year when the next IDMC and 100% of events around mid next year. And the enrollment started? Uh, the remember? first patient was enrolled in early 13. Uh, but as I said, the, was the way enrollment started, it really was all enrolled second half of 13 through first half of 15. 462 okay. total patients. First half of 15. Okay, well, we can do some game yeah. theory here. Um, and 
and we will. Um, but last uh, question, and um, we're running out of time, but one of the things that really strikes me as being different from other cell therapy companies is, as you mentioned, you, you out of one you know, patient sample, you could get three years of dosing. Can you tell us a little bit about your process there and what enables that? Right, so what we do is we, so we, we collect uh, white blood cells through a leukapheresis like many cell therapy companies do. And then we isolate the monocytes and the number of monocytes we get from that uh, leukapheresis collection determines how many doses we get. And so we have a standard and as long as we have uh, enough cells to start with to make at least eight doses, which is the first year of therapy, then, then we continue. If we don't, then we will ask for a second leukapheresis. That happens occasionally. Uh, there might be a lot of debris in the leuk collection and, and we're not a lot of granulocytes, for example, with kidney cancer patients. Uh, but, but that happens uh, only, only rarely. Uh, but once you have those uh, monocytes, the RNA, the tumor we sample providing the RNA, we make as much RNA as we need to treat the patient forever and we can store it. And so for patients, as I said, on average, you're getting three years of treatment. We have many patients from phase two and now even phase three who are living longer. They come for a second phoresis. We use the same RNA, we make another batch and we keep treating them. So we actually have a paper that was just submitted on long-term follow-up on a couple of patients who are still in remission from the phase two trial who are now seven years out where we've made multiple batches. It's very cool. Any other questions for Jeff at this point? Looking forward to an eventful year for you. Great. Thanks Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Charles. Thank you.